Before I left New England for Alaska, my mom kept saying, Christy, I just know you're going to meet someone up there. And next thing I know, I'm going to be planning a wedding in Alaska. I would tell her not to worry. I wasn't going north to find a man, but for an adventure. I'd be back on the East Coast at the end of graduate school. Sure, I might date men in Alaska, but I did not want a relationship. I just finished three years working for a domestic violence shelter while painfully untangling my life from the wrong man. The last thing I wanted was to get involved with someone new. My friend Kim and I, out there, both in our mid to late 20s, traveled from Maine to Alaska via Texas. No jobs, no bills, no boyfriends, just two free women heading west. And we arrived in Anchorage in August in 2000 to attend Alaska Pacific University. APU begins the semester with a block course. I signed up for Intro to Wilderness Skills, but when I met my advisor, Dave McGivern, he convinced me and Kim to take his more advanced class, Expedition Leadership, a 21-day hiking trip on terrain without trails with the students responsible for all the logistics. At the time, I thought that maybe my 10 days on the Appalachian Trail qualified me for this more advanced class. <laughs> Looking back, I'm almost positive McGivern wanted us on the course for the social experiment of adding two older feminist women to his class of eight undergraduate young men. <laughs> I can just see him thinking, this is going to make the group dynamics more fun. And it worked, and we signed up, and I walked into that classroom on that first day, and I saw blue eyes set in such a handsome face that I paused till he looked down at the newspaper at his desk and I quickly remembered, too young. If he was still in college, that meant back when I was a high school teacher, he could have been one of my students. Definitely too young. Yet, I couldn't stop glancing in his direction as our professor introduced the course and Dave dove right into the dangers. Bears, avalanches, hypothermia, careless mistakes, injuries, death. I glanced at the boy with a paper on his desk and for a heartbeat, our eyes locked. During the week of prep time, Kim was in the food group. I was in the equipment group. The blue-eyed guy was in the food group, so I volunteered to help them, too. <laughs> During our Costco trips and food packing, I learned that Nick may have been five years my junior, but when it came to maturity, we stood on the same semi-worn ground. He was different than other guys. He wasn't out to conquer peaks and impress the girls with his manliness, but he was seeking silence and beauty in the Alaska range. He was a fly fishing, whitewater rafting guide, the quintessential outdoorsman who also listened to Ani DeFranco. <laughs> Comfortable with power tools and mixing bowls, ice axes and whisks, he was the most complex, unassuming man I'd ever met. And he had a girlfriend. When we started the hike from the side of the road, and I literally mean just the side of the road, no trailhead or parking lot, somewhere near Healy, bushwhacking through Devil's Club and Alders, climbing over and under fallen trees with our overloaded packs, I followed behind Nick and I watched the way his body moved. I didn't plan to like another woman's boyfriend. That's not who I thought I was. I was a feminist, not a homewrecker, and an older one at that, cradle robber. <laughs> But I couldn't stop watching him, and I knew he was eager to spend three weeks in the wilderness away from a relationship with more arguments and laughter. And I knew a bit what it was like to stay with what's familiar, even when the bad outweighs the good, and to need a change of landscape just to get out. After the tangle of the woods, we made it to our first riverbed, where Nick and I walked side by side, and we passed the miles by asking each other questions. What's your family like? What do you want to do when you graduate? What brought you to Alaska? What do you dream about? Do you like to dance? What do you want to cook for dinner tonight? When four members of our group had to leave due to sickness and injuries and our tent groups needed to be reorganized, before I could even think about why I shouldn't, I volunteered to join Nick's tent. <laughs> I liked him, despite not wanting to like anyone. But because he had a girlfriend, I wasn't sure if he liked me in the way I liked him. Not until Cody passed, a morning climb through a foot of newly fallen snow on a day when Nick woke up not feeling well, and I felt my strongest. Little five foot two me leading the whole pack, post-holing up the side of the mountain with 50 pounds on my back. Nick caught up to me midway, and we walked side by side with snow up to our thighs instead of using each other's footprints. When we reached the summit first, just the two of us, 
he slid his arm through mine and looked at me in a way that said, yeah, I like you too. Somewhere in that second week, after countless moments of eye contact with Nick and endless trailside conversation, I spent a morning strolling along with our professor, Dave. And he turned to me and he said, so um, how long have you and Kim been together? <laughs> And I can't really blame him for making the assumption. I mean, Kim and I were roommates who showed up in Alaska in my Subaru. I wore my hair boy short. She didn't shave her legs. We were the type of friends who could read each other's eyes without talking. But since Dave assumed we were lesbians, he missed the fact that Nick and I leaned towards breaking one of his trip rules. No relationships can start during an expedition. Not that we could start. Not with Nick committed to another. But we could wonder. Our tent slept Three, all of us zipped in our respective down bags with me in the middle lying on my side facing Nick. We'd stay up talking as our tent mate softly snored, staring into each other's eyes, with me silently saying what I didn't dare verbalize, I think I love you. We held hands by the end of that second week lying there in that tent, and our first kiss involved his sun-cracked lips on my fingertips. I knew what I was doing was wrong, and yet everything about Nick and I felt right. Avalanches turned us back from our intended route, and we were forced to end our expedition early. When the van came to pick us up, I sat in a window seat and cried, not out of relief to return to civilization, but because I didn't want the magic of the trip to end. I wanted to keep walking with everything I needed on my back and this man I wasn't looking for by my side. I didn't want to return to Anchorage where a younger woman waited with the power to break the spell, to call Nick's name and bring him home, where he could dismiss the intensity of our connection to a mere adventure in the wilds of the Alaska Range. When the van dropped us off on campus, we hugged goodbye, and we walked our separate ways. Late that same night, as I unpacked my gear, I heard a knock on the kitchen door. I opened it to see Nick leaning against the frame, a six-pack in his hand. I did it, he said. It's over, and now I can't go home. He looked at me with those glacier blue eyes and he said, do you want to go somewhere? I did. And well, as it turns out, and as my mom loves to remind me, <laughs> she was right. <laughs> Thank you.